Go ahead. Sean here, and I am with Joe Queer. Joe Queer from the Queers. Uh, the Queers are one of my favorite punk rock bands of all time. Actually, um, your song, I Always Knew, is actually being my life song. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, shit. <laughs> Wish we could play it. <laughs> Uh, that's all good, man. Um, I just got ten quick questions for you. Awesome. Um, first one: What is, I've heard a lot of interpretations of your band name. Uh, what is the actual real inspiration behind your band name? Is there a story behind it? Just when we grew up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I had lived out west, like and saw Black Flag, and so I would like I lived in Benison and South Bay, and so I would see Black Flag with the four you know, bars everywhere in the South Bay and LA and so like we're like, all right, let's do the queers and then we'll spray paint it everywhere in town and like we're too lazy to do the spray paint thing, but that's kinda where it started. We just wanted a name that would piss people off and that people would remember. And it was kind of a joke really and then here we are years later, but that was it really to piss off the art back. Yeah, I actually uh, put on my Facebook says that I was going to be interviewing you guys, and one of my lesbian friends goes, Ooh, I'm like, No, they're not gay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's funny how, uh, yeah, Pansy Division kind of did that thing where right. they are gay, but uh, yeah, it's weird. Usually, usually, like, I grew up with Circle Jerks and the DKs and Dickies, and so, you know, you kind of get the joke, and most punks do, so. Right on. Um, now, the Queers started back in 1982, and from 1984 you guys broke up, then reformed back in 1990. Why was there a big gap? We never really were serious about playing. We never had wanted to play steady, you know. Like, I moved out west again, and Tula went to New York, and then that lineup broke up. And then in the late 80s, off and on, we'd play around Boston as the Queers. Like, we played with the Descendants, Dickies. Angry Samoans. We were like that band that knew everybody in Boston, so we would get on. We knew the Ramones, so we'd open up for them a few times, and so th that was kind of just you know a thing to do on weekends, really. And then in 1990, we got together, me, Hugh, and we met Beefus, and we wanted to make one album, which was Love Songs. And um, so, and then I owned a restaurant. And we were just like that was it. We wanted to do one good album, put it out ourselves on vinyl. And then we met Ben Weasel, and then they weren't even together, Screech and Weasel, and then they did Look Out, My Brain Hurts, and then, you know, we got to look out, and then it was like a weird way we kind of, you know, got into that whole scene, so that's what happened there. Now, um, did you guys ever expect to actually, you know, still be a fan as of this day, and did you expect that, you know, with your album Love Songs for the Retarded uh, to, you know, make your fan base skyrocket so much? Well, we didn't know about the, when Lookout, you know, got swept up with Off Ivy and then Green Day hit a big, that whole scene got, got you know, swept up. So, no, I didn't, you know, I, I don't even know how long we'll go back, but it's like, I still have, we have fun, Dave and I playing, Justin from the Nobodies, he's not on this leg of the tour, he's coming out with us for the next few months, but um, it's kind of like, we love seeing our friends and, um, so you kind of get addicted to that life, and so I mean we're we're taking it tour by tour now. But no, of course not. You know, back then it would have been an acid trip to to even think that you, you know, back when we started, even touring was like the a loser proposition, like Black Flag or you know Social D and and Youth Brigade. It was like a losing proposition. You couldn't make money. Then all of a sudden Green Day was touring, and they were fucking drawing a thousand kids, and then. We went out with Screeching Weasel, and then we went out with the Rancid, and then, you know, I was like, hey, uh, Dad, I'm selling the restaurant, I'm fucking, like, you know, going to go tour, so I'm going to have that in life, so, um, no, yeah, no, it was like, we didn't even think we'd get royalty checks and stuff, it was like, no, we never thought it. <laughs> no. Well, you guys definitely but I, I think to elaborate on that, I think it gave a lot of the bands back then a little more um, legitimacy because none of us had a safety net under us. We, it wasn't a career move because, you know, you couldn't make money touring, so it was like we only did it because we loved it. Bob Ivy, The Muffs, Mighty Mighty Boss Town, Screech and Weasel, Green Day. You know, Green Day, Boss Towns, a lot of those bands made it. They were doing that shit because of the love for music. It wasn't, none of us ever thought we'd fucking make, you know, in their case, millions or, you know, a lot of money to be able to do this. So um, there was no safety net. It was either Welcome to Burger King, May I Take Your Order, or Punk Rock. For a lot of those bands now with, you know, Good Charlotte and all those bands, you know, um, the scene lost the integrity and, and then 
and it can be a career move. You know what I mean? You know, uh, bands that suck. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. I know. I mean, when I grew up at the Rad, going and playing in the late eighties, if you suck, they throw bottles at you. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I was a little worried sometimes. It made you play your ass off, you know, because you were like, "Fuck, man!" I saw a lot of shit down there at the Rad, but you know, you fucking it, it picked your game up a lot back in the day. Um, now, what made you guys decide after having six albums on Lookout Records in 2006 to leave and join Asian Man Team, and why the short span with Hopeless Records? Oh, uh, well, at the time we went on Hopeless, me and Beefface and Hugh were fighting, and we were, the deal was we were going to sign to Epitaph, and we shook hands on a deal with Epitaph, and then Brett went AWOL for about a year, him and Gina, his girlfriend, and like nobody saw them, so um, Andy, I think his name was, was like, dude, we don't know what's going on. So that was where we were going. Then I knew Lewis, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we want to work with you. So I went there because Hugh got cancer, and we were all fighting over money. And, um, you know, I was fucked up. I mean, it was just a mess. We, we went from a band that was just practicing in my restaurant basement on Saturdays, drinking beer and playing the, sh- the odd show, opening up for bands, to, like, making money and being able to tour and royalty checks coming in. So it was a weird thing. And I, I couldn't handle it that much. You know, it was just a party, you know, so uh, it was a mess. But anyway, so we went to Hopeless, which was like the worst label I ever went to. And then and then we did the one last album, Pleasant Screams, for Lookout, but they were on the way down. And then Asia Man, I met through Ben Weasel. And I've never been happier. I mean, Asia Man was like the early days when we were on Lookout. Larry Livermore and Mike Park are two of the best guys yeah, ever. Mike Park being in Skanking. Sure, that's when I met him on the Rancid tour. You know, Mike's top notch. I, I, you know, great guy. Runs it out of his garage. Cares about his band. You know, picks the phone up. You know, he's just great. Sends statements out on time. But, you know, great guy. So that's what happened with us. But. Uh, now, I heard that you guys are being labeled as the Ramones meets the Beach Boys. How does that label make you feel? Uh, he, you know, that's fine. I mean, yeah. you know, our last album, just the new album we just came out with is more like Love Songs and Day Late. You know, it's more like those 32-second long punk songs. Uh, yeah, th- that's cool. You know, I mean, I've been called worse things than that, so fuck it, you know. Um, now, how tough was it going through so many band members over the years? I noticed you guys went through a lot of different band members. The first lineup was me, Tulu, and Whippy, and then that was not meant to stay long anyway. And then it was me, Hugh, and B-Face, and so that stayed together for the lookout years. And then Dave, Dangerous Dave, he came aboard for Punk Rock Confidential, and he's been here pretty much ever since, so it's me and Dave now. Uh, you know, the way I look at it is... Um, we don't make a ton of money like the other bands, you know, no effects and rants and all that. So, you know, a lot of us work jobs and stuff. So it's hard. That plays a big part in it, you know what I mean, more than, like, the lineup breaking up. So we kind of, like, got it now where we have a revolving door of a few drummers, like Adam's on this leg, Lurch will be on the next, Justin for the Nobodies, Dusty Watson, who plays for Dick Dale, among others, Agent Orange. He, he's our backup drummer. He comes in, but, I mean, you know, it keeps it fresh. For Dave and I, like we've got a rhythm player, Ben Vermin's our rhythm player, so he's able to tour. Sometimes he can come out, sometimes he can't. Whippy, our old singer, comes in, so it keeps it fresh and fun for us because like we have some different people. And the other thing is like it doesn't matter if it's me and your mom in a grass skirt and I'm playing a ukulele. If we're up there and I'm singing a queer song, it's the queers, you know. So fuck it, yeah. Um, now, how is it frequently uh, collaborating with Ben Weasel and Screeching Weasel, and do you got any good Ben Weasel stories? Yeah, uh, we, uh, Ben's one of my best friends, and we've, I'm actually supposed to go in the studio singing the new Screeching Weasel album, I think, Saturday or something. Um, yeah, it was fun. You know, I really look up to Ben. He's such a great songwriter, so he always inspired me, and... Um, so, you know, Screeching Weasel to me is head and shoulders above all the other bands out there pretty much, you know. Um, yeah, it was fun. We usually, the best times we have writing, usually me and him, are um, we write the song in five minutes, like we have a song title, and then we just write it. But, um, you know, I can't think of any stories other than just, you know, I mean, it's always been fun recording with him, and we'll probably do it again, you know. We've talked about doing an album together, but yeah, he's good. Ben's Ben's good. Yeah. So if you guys ever do something together like that, I'd definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'd like to. He's uh, doing it, doing so well with Screeching Weasel. I think yeah. he got, he had, you know, the kids, and then he had, had to go back to work. You know, I don't think he would have played except for the, the 
kid, the girls being born. So I'm so happy to see them playing. You know, it helps us. It helps the whole scene because they were like the leaders of the scene and gone for so long. So I'm so happy to see them playing and stuff. Now your uh, newest album, which is on Asian Man Records, Back to the Basement, uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Is there a story behind it? Just, we kind of, like, it run the course on the Beach Boys, poppy stuff, and so I wanted to kind of go back to how we used to record, like, on Kicked Out of the Weeblows and This Place Sucks, where, like, back then you wouldn't have any budget. You'd, we, i pay for it, so, like, we'd always go into the studio and we would never get too cute because we didn't have the money. We'd always be short on cash to pay the engineer in the studio. So we'd just, like, have three hours and we'd just tune up and we'd just play. And, like, nobody cares that, like, uh, bass was out of tune on This Place Sucks and nobody cares about a lot of the shit. So we went back to that whole basic premise, Dave and I, where we just did it, basically, we went to tape and we just did it, you know, uh, drums, bass, and guitar, I opened up the vocals. I mean, we did it on tape with no compression on the way in, and we didn't, couldn't even do overdubs because the studio was so rudimentary. And so we had to play all our parts straight through, even the overdub parts like the vocals. There was no punches on the album. So, you know, like on some stuff, like a vocal won't be on perfect. I think a lot of, we wanted to go back to that early, day of record, early days of recording. I think a lot of the, um, you know, punk recordings have been taken hostage by engineers and producers where like all of a sudden the punk rock, you know, we're supposed to make these, you know, Whitney Houston-esque, you know, big huge productions where like it used to be, you know, a sock in the gut, you know, punk rock. And forget about having every hair in place, let's go for enthusiasm and passion and the grit as opposed to like, oh, well, we gotta, hey, that vocal's out of fucking place, so let's cut and paste this bullshit. So we went tape. And, you know, just uh, didn't go digital and, and, you know, did it that way. If you listen to, like, the instrumental, there's, like, a note I didn't hit perfectly. Nobody gives a flying fuck. Pull me out of it. Like, on the lead, I doubled that up because I couldn't play it that fast because I'm not Eddie Van Halen. And that's not perfect either. But nobody notices it. Nobody gives a fuck. They, you know, it's a good song. That was Ben's favorite on the new album, he told me. And it came out great. So, yeah, we went back to that. It was kind of refreshing where, like, we looked at each other after we played it. And we're like, that was a take right there, you know? And then we just had a rhythm guitar and vocals and fucking had fun doing it. So uh, it was really refreshing. Yeah. Really refreshing, you know. So I really am happy with the album. Yeah, so am I. I actually uh, listened to it just the other day. And, yeah. Uh, it, it sounds just like the old. Yeah, it sounds more like us playing live. So um, you know, a lot of stuff like I always knew. I love that stuff, but we can't play it live because right. it's just the kids always want to hear this place sucks or Ursula. <laughs> so we're like, all right, let's just make an album where we can play almost all the shit live, like you know, we cover white minority and stuff. So we've been playing that. So that's that's. Great, or Tit Fuck, the, the second song of the album. We always play that. Kids love it already. So. Uh, do you guys got any crazy fan or tour stories you like to share? Oh, God. You know, people ask us that stuff, and I can never think of, like, crazy tour stories. So, like, you know, I'm driving in the van tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, I should have said that. You know. That's what everybody says when I ask that question. I know. I can't think of it. I don't. I can't think of it whenever I'm put on the spot. You know, touring itself is just crazy, so it's like just, you know, one thing after another, and, and so I can't think of anything, you know, real crazy, so. All right. Uh, do any of you guys have, have any side projects besides Queers? Dave's got the bugs. He does the bugs, so um, they tour and stuff now and then, little tours. So he's got that. We were doing the drunk controllers, but I think we put that to rest. So uh, I might release a solo album, but mainly just stuff bands I produced that um, uh, I've sung with. You know, they asked me to sing a song, so I'm thinking I've got enough songs now. The Manges and Huntingtons and whoever, Mark Pelican. So I think nobody's going to put an album together to do that. So that's kind of a side project, but. Basically, you know, the Queers is my band, so it's like we do. My solo stuff is the Queers solo, <laughs> so, sort of. So, all right. And last but not least, uh, what does the future hold for the Queers? Any other new albums, tours? What can your fans expect? We're just touring for this album pretty much nonstop. We've got three weeks off after this. Then we do three weeks with the Apers um, from Holland and the U.S. and Canada. Then we got like a few days off and fly over to Italy. In Switzerland, we do them, and then we fly up to Russia for a week, then to the UK for 10 shows, 
then home, and then we're doing a three-week thing for Ben Weasel's. Got some Weasel Fest going in June nice. or May or something, and then we're uh, going to Montreal. So that'll be a three-weeker. Oh, no, we're going to Japan, too, and possibly Australia if we feel like it. We'll see. So we're really busy right up to pretty much summer. And then after that, yeah, we'll record a new album, so we're already working on that. And then tour for that. After that, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I was like trying to start another restaurant, you know, to stay home more, so that might happen. I don't know. You know, I just like to do stuff. Music is one thing. The restaurant was a very creative for me, too, because I was like chef owner. I like, I need something that gets me out of bed in the morning. You know what I mean? So the music, always, there's always that sort of energy I'm addicted to. Like, you know, you got this fucking tour to do, or you got an album to make, or you want to write this song, or someone's doing something. So I really like that energy, and... And who knows, maybe I'll get a restaurant. And there's that sort of energy in that, too, you know. So, um, I don't know what's around the bend in the river. Maybe really you can besides. do a restaurant with a stage for bands to play. <laughs> I was good at when I went and that fell through last year. I had a really cool all-ages place. But, yeah, you never know. I mean, you know, that's the exciting thing. It's like I kind of get to the, got to the point where it's like, okay, I could go down this path or that path or this path. And all of them are going to be okay, you know what I mean? It's, it's uh, you know, they're all going to be okay. So none of them's going to be a failure or necessarily better than the other one, you know what I mean? You have to learn by the, the journey you're on through music or whatever. That's how I grew up, you know what I mean? you got to learn and hopefully be a better person at the end of it than I was before going in. I think I am, you know. I mean, I think, I see some of these bands get real arrogant and think, they walk on water because they sell a few albums to some drunken jocks on the warp tour. And it's like, dude, you know, if you're going to be a bigger asshole at the end of this fucking great job journey that we're on than you were before, you might as well just go manage a Taco Bell because you're a fucking asshole. you got to learn by it, you know. So, I mean, getting to know people like the Ramones, Joey Ramone, I got to know fairly well. I mean, he was a real humble dude, and here's a guy who changed... You know, not just music, but the world, really, through his music. And it's like he was humble and was just about making another song. And so, you know, I don't have much you know, patience with these fucking nowhere bands that are arrogant, you know? Like, they think that's what it's all about, and it's not, you know? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do the job. That's how we feel in this band. So, you know, and, and it's more about getting... You can't put a price tag on traveling around the world and getting to meet people and... Be, you know, seeing how they live, and we're going to Russia, you know, we've been to China, and, you know, Brazil, and you name it, we've been there, it's like all through music, so I'm, I'm pretty grateful, you know, and humbled by it, you know, so it's all gravy, really, you know, we, we really only wanted to play one show with Screech and Weasel and put out one album, honest to God, that's the true, true story, back then, we just wanted to play with Screech and Weasel one show, <laughs> I'm not <looking> at you now. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty funny, but, yeah, it's been all good, so. All right, I do thank you for taking the thank time for the Thank you very much, Sean. Thank Ladies you, Tony. Joe Queer from the Queers. Yes.